Welcome back to John's Films, the place we do editing effects, benchmarks, and hardware recommendations for DaVinci Resolve. Today we're examining what build would make the most sense for a DaVinci Resolve free edition workstation, around $1,200. I'm going to use PC Part Picker as my build platform because it gives me an easy way to validate many of the constraints around these parts. One thing to note, it is not perfect. So, you'll see some spots where I go validate things outside of the PC Part Picker workflow. Now, the first thing I need to choose is a processor. And in this case, I'm going to use the PC Part Picker filters. I know that in DaVinci Resolve Free, the more cores I can add, the better, because it does not leverage hardware acceleration through graphics cards or even through Intel's QuickSync technology. So, I need to have more cores so that I can continue to separate the work and do more work uh, in less time. In that case, as I choose 8 plus cores here in the core count, and now I'm going to choose the latest chipsets from Intel and AMD, you'll notice very quickly if we sort by price, here we are, AMD sits on those bottom price points and is absolutely destroying Intel on the price for performance because of that. More cores, they're on a faster fabrication process, which is the 7 nanometer node against Intel's 12. What that really means is that it needs less power here at 65 watts. It needs, uh, for the clock speed that it's going to run at, it also needs less cooling. And so we're able to get by with the stock cooler, and it really becomes a great value pr proposition all the way around. I'm adding the 3700X, and now I need to choose a cooler, except, which you'll notice here on the left, this one comes with a cooler, included CPU cooler, and given it's only a $1,200 workstation, I'm absolutely going to use that. It is very adequate. It does a great job. Really, I've got no complaints about AMD's boxed coolers. So I'll skip that. I don't need to spend money on it. Next, I'm going to choose a motherboard. Now, in this case, we have some options. In the AMD side, we've got, you'll see, B450, as well as X470, B550, and X570 motherboards. What's the difference? Well, the B450 and X570 were built of the Ryzen chips of the second release. That's the 2000 series. Whereas the X570 and B550 were built for the 3000 series. However, you can use any of those and still be happy. Uh, the difference, though, is PCIe Gen 4 is enabled, as well as some higher memory clocks are supported by the 5 series chipsets. So... For future compatibility, I'd much prefer to spend on an X570 or a B550 board. However, I don't want to spend too much more because this build won't take advantage of it. So I'm going to filter down to just those 470, 570, 450, 550 boards. Now I'm going to sort by price. I can go crazy here. I mean, I can go up to a $500 motherboard if I really want to. Uh, pretty easy. In fact, this is the board I've got in my uh, Dream Workstation, and it's fantastic for connectivity, etc., what you're typically paying for as you go up here is more memory compatibility, more features and connectivity. You'll get USB Type-C ports for the front of the case. You'll get wireless networking built onto the boards, um, some active overclocking features if you really get up there. But today what we need is a board which is going to support a wide variety of memory and a board that has all of the features that we need. And so I'm going to start around here, this Aorus Elite board from Gigabyte. Um, I previously was recording this exact video and tried to use this ASUS board as well as this ASRock board. The challenge with that is it's very hard to find compatible memory. So we'll start with this uh, Gigabyte board. And I'm going to jump in, see what it's got. Um, ATX form factor, that's what I want. It gives me the space I need. I don't like that the maximum memory is only 64 gigabytes because I'd like to use this board on future builds. Further, they only support up to 3200 megahertz memory. So while it may seem like a great deal, I'd really like to have a faster memory specification than just 3200 megahertz. So that B450 Aorus Elite is out for me, and I'm going to jump up $124 ASRock B550 Gaming Phantom Gaming 4 motherboard. And the memory speed goes much faster. However, that may seem brilliant. Why don't I click Add? The reason, I've already been down this road. And what happens is you get into the specific qualified vendor list of memory. That's memory that's been tested with this board by the vendor and is supported. And none of this RAM, especially those that have 16 gigabyte sticks that I want, are readily available. And none of them actually have uh, heat spreaders or coolers on them. They're all green PCB. And it's 2020, people. 
I'm not going to recommend RAM that looks hideous in my build. So I'm going to go back to PC Part Picker, skip that one as well. And now I'm going to jump down to some of the newer B550 boards. So that's that Phantom Gaming 4. Here's an Aorus Pro B550 micro ATX build. I would like an ATX build, so I keep going. Phantom Gaming 4, you can guarantee yourself this is going to have many of the same restrictions that the Phantom Gaming 4 does. This one just has wireless networking. That's the AC on the end, the AC spec for wireless networking. This MSI B550A Pro looks pretty promising at $140, though. Let's look at the specs on it. And what I'm looking for here is the form factor, ATX. It's got a B550 chi chipset, 128 gigabytes of RAM. That's good. High RAM speed compatibility. Looks like it's got a couple of M.2 slots, which is great. It's got a Gen 2 header for USB 3.2. No wireless networking, which is fine. I plug in all my machines, and it has the RAID support of the chipset. I like this one. I'm going to add it. It is a pre-order note, so we'll have to keep an eye on that this month. The other thing we need to keep an eye on is whether or not this actually supports a wide variety of memories. So I can jump in. I'm going to Google just the motherboard name. I'm going to ensure I go to the manufacturer's website. All of the motherboard websites are pretty much laid out the same. You've got a support bucket up top, and when you're on the product page for the specific product, you have a support button here. Click on that, and then I start poking around. I'm going to look at manual, utility, Win 1064. Okay, these are downloads. And what I'm looking for is this compatibility link here. This compatibility tells me the processor compatibility as well as the memory. So this is the Matisse memory. That's the generation of the chipset that we're using, generation of the processor, I should say. And now I'm able to filter by speed as well as density. I'm going to choose, in this case, I'm looking for manufacturer. Wow, look at all the RAM that is compatible with this thing. This is fantastic. All right, I really like this board. They've done a good job. And this can also indicate to you that they've invested in this program, and you should likely be able to expect a solid BIOS behind it as well because it costs a lot of money to go out and validate all of this memory. So supported speed is what we care about here. And we want to make sure that we've got 16 gigabyte sticks and that four DIM, that's three chicks here, are available. I'm going to go to Corsair, which I've had great experience with in the past. I'm going to look for some 16 gigabyte sticks. The reason is the 16 gigabyte sticks with dual channel is what I really want. Um, 16 gigabyte allows me to get up to 64 gigabytes of RAM in the system. Now I only really need to buy two of them for 32 gigabytes in this build, but in the future I sure would like the ability to add two more sticks to get to 64. This C15 on the end of this SKU means it's a cast latency 15, which means it's got very tight timings, um, and that's the fetch instructions for the RAM, and as it stands will likely be pretty expensive, but we will see. So I've googled that exact SKU. I want to make sure that when I click on RAM I find it, and it's got that exact skew. This one is right here, and my Google term was that. So you can see it does not have the exact skew. GX4MA, and it's different there. So that's not the RAM I'm looking for. However, if I take this and reverse it and go back to this, uh, list, there it is, it's the next thing on the list. So this is 3000 3, megahertz RAM. I'd really like to get something 32, 3466, something faster. So I'm going to skip the Corsair stuff for the moment until I see something. Here's some 3200. Let's check this out. Runs in dual channel. Will not run with four sticks, only one or two. This one's 32 megahertz RAM that will run in four channel at 16 gigabytes. That looks like a good one. Notice the timings are up a little bit, a little longer. And I Google that so I can get a good view of the RAM and what I'm looking for. I now know it's Vengeance LPX RAM, and it is a 32 gig kit for 174 pounds. Somehow Google Corsair, they think I'm in Europe at the moment. And probably that Mr. Alex Tech wearing off on me. Let's see. So I'm going to go to Newegg and see what they have to say about it. Expensive, expensive, expensive memory. Yeah, shipped and sold not by Newegg. So let's see what else we got here. Last thing I can do is try and find an Amazon link for that. Here we go. 
Amazon says 158 for two sticks of 16. This looks really, really promising. Again, they've got me in pounds. I don't know why. But um, this looks promising. It should be about 160 bucks. I like it. So this will be the RAM that I'm going to go with. It's this Vengeance LPX RAM. I've had good luck with this in the past on Ryzen platforms. And we now know that it is certified to work specifically motherboard chipset. So I go back to my PC part picker. I choose memory. I'm going to search for that specific SKU. Here it is at $154 for two 16 gigabyte sticks. Then I add it to my board. This is how I know that this RAM will work with this motherboard with this processor. Saves you a lot of RMA time in the, in the backside there. Choose storage. On this build, I'd really like to get an NVMe drive, but it's not necessary. In fact, the NVMe drives, while very fast in quick bursts, and sometimes that's helpful, the NLE, DaVinci Resolve, and the, the fetch and the way that it works with storage greatly overshadows that. So I'll look at the price by terabyte. I'm going to go with the terabyte drive on this build that allows us to put our OS on that drive, have some space for a photo library or something else, and then we'll, if it's in the budget, potentially add another drive later, and we'd put all of our working footage on that extra drive. So from an SSD perspective, capacity, I'm going to come to the filters, and this is where we really get a lot of good luck with PC part picker. Go just under a terabyte, filter that down to get the noise out. Um, I would like an SSD. And from a cache perspective, um, the bigger the better, but we'll leave it where it is and see what we can figure out. The interface, I'm good with any of the interfaces. Um, here I can choose whether I want the NVMe or the higher speed access or not. I'm just going to leave it as it is. You can see there's Kingston A400, something to be aware of on these. Many of these lower end SSDs are not going to have what's called a cache or a write through cache, which allows you to buffer um, instead of waiting for something to write, you can buffer it to their cache, and the cache then purges it out later, storing it to the disk. It can also be used as a read cache, where you can read things you've recently read and not, and not been able to store in your memory on your system. Somewhere around here, this A-Data um, I've used before, the SU-800 has a sizable cache in it and works quite well. I will add that. So now we've got a terabyte for our operating system, our Resolve program, and our project files. I'd prefer to put the project files elsewhere, but with the budget, we're going to see what we've got left over. We're already halfway through. We haven't bought a graphics card. Time for that. With our graphics card, it's more important that we spent the money up front with the RAM and the CPU because the graphics card, while it gets leveraged in the free edition, does not get leveraged as heavily. Many of the GPU accelerated tasks are not enabled. And so what we're going to do is try and find that price performance break. I think the RX 2060 is a good break in price and performance if we can find one cheap enough. The um, 1660 or 1660 Ti becomes really our sweet spot. So I'm going to sort by price, and that's just acknowledging that that's going to be a major blow on our budget. I'm going to filter this down to the 1660s. Um, I'm not going to dip into 1650 at this point. See if we can reach into a 2060 Super. On the AMD front, I could also try the 5700 series. Note there are new graphics cards likely coming out soon from both NVIDIA and AMD. So we need to pay attention to that. Um, the 1660 is $200 with 6 gigabyte VRAM cache or video RAM, video memory. And that typically is going to stick. Here we go with the 2060s at $400. Don't think that's going to fit into our budget considering case, power supply, and some of the other things we need. So I'm going to have to drop back to something. And yes, we're just shopping by price at this point. Here's a 2060, 350. 300 for a 2060 with 6 gigabytes or a 1660 Ti. I want the RTX fun just for when I'm not editing. And so I think this MSI Ventus XSOC would be great if we can find one in stock. They are all over the place. So we will add that in, and it is going to run us just under $300. Should work pretty well for us here. And even if we do go to studio, it's going to be something that we're able to leverage in the studio uh, version. So that's a good upgrade path. Next on the case, we're now down to about our last $300. 
and we need to make sure that we're still spending on the case and the power supply with some fans if we need them. So I'm going to look for a case under, say, $90. I want something that's not too painful to build in, but I'm willing to deal with it a little bit if I have to. I like something that has an ATX form factor. Most important, it fits. And um, from a drive bay perspective, I don't need drive bays because of all the SSD love these days. And we'll keep it under 150 bucks. And this NZXT H510 I've personally built in. It works great. It is a little smaller. It's a mid-tower. Um, so if you wanted to add multiple graphics cards, it's not going to work. But for our build and our price point, this is magical. So I will add that. It does come with, I think, two fans. Let's check it out. Do, 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 do. Internal bays. I don't see the added fans. All right. So let's... Uh, search to make sure we get some fans with that because I don't want to have to spend money on fans after buying the case and filters accessories fan support included included so we get two fans included which would actually be pretty adequate top front for exhaust and intake and probably won't uh, won't hit us real bad on performance so that is beautiful two fans with the $78 case which looks pretty decent I'm a fan yeah, I, I said it. All right, now we need a power supply. What we've got going so far, we probably need a 650 to 750 uh, power supply in terms of wattage. I'd love to get something 80 plus gold, but we'll see what the price gives us. So I'm going to filter down to wattage and go, go as low as 625 and as high as 875. I'll sort on that. There we go. I want something from a name I recognize with a wattage, wow, bronze for 75 bucks. Now this, the way that we're picking these, um, this is not what they call a modular power supply, meaning that the cables are attached. The downside to that is, especially in the smaller case we're using, the cables have to go somewhere. And if you get a modular one, then you can plug and unplug only the ones you need, and it saves you space. So let's see, this is a killer deal on a solid power supply. But let's see if we can find something modular or semi-modular that would work for us. I don't see a, here we go, semi-modular filter. What this means is this 24 pin and the CPU accessory are attached, and then you've got some modularity associated with the rest of the plugs. Um, this one you noticed, however, only has two PCIe feeds, two SATA feeds, and probably one 8-pin CPU feed or something. Um, not really very robust when it comes to its connectivity and what it can power. So you might find yourself in trouble in a future upgrade where I bet this Thermaltake Tough Power, yep, it has a bunch more connectivity to it, meaning you're going to be able to power more stuff at 750 watts. It's 80 plus gold certified for $110. That is the steel that I like. So I'm going to add that. And now I'm going to check where I am on budget. 1164 Past that, it becomes operating system. And, you know, we said we'd go back if we had a little bit of money on the end for some more storage. And I'm going to do that just now. So I go back and I'm looking for another drive. I did really like this $115 drive. Um, it was pretty magical, but I'm not going to be able to afford that right now. I can afford a 500 gigabyte project working drive. It's an M.2 drive. I will add that in. It is a cheaper one. It is not one that I'd use for long-term storage, but... Um, at the access speeds that I'd expect out of this SSD, note it is not NVMe, but what I would expect out of this, it should be good for our project files and provide some separation between the executing program and the files that I'm working on. That takes us to 1234.17 and gives us a well-rounded DaVinci Resolve free workstation. For more hardware recommendations and for more tips and tricks, please subscribe to the channel. If this was helpful to you, feel free to buy me a coffee. You can see the link below. And come check us out on the Discord. We're happy to help at any time. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.